there's some benefit in sauna. If they add sauna to cold plunge, there's significant benefit. So that that hot cold contrast is definitely been shown to be beneficial. So I do it more just because it feels good and it's a part of my habit more than trying to get some health benefit. And I, I guarantee that a dinner with eight people after they've taken a sauna together is just a different experience. And people go away from that evening. They just always call back or write back and say, that was one of the best evenings that we've had. Our toxins being actually removed from the body. Guess who's coming to sauna? Hekilunta. Guess who's coming to sauna? Hekilunta. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of The Upper Bench. We are here today to talk a little bit more about sauna, as always. Um, you know, I've been hitting the sauna regularly. It's uh, it's a little cool here. It's still, you know, uh, as of the date of recording this, you know, we're still kind of in the, the throes of winter. So um, I'm still heating up my wood-burning sauna as frequently as I can. Um, Risto, how about you? Well, we we got some snow, which is we haven't gotten much this winter, but we got some recently. So that was nice. And uh, been sounding a few times. Um, actually, this past weekend, got to use a new public one up in the Twin Cities called Soundable. Oh, sure. And, How was that? Uh, um, it was interesting. It was interesting. Um, most of the people there were new. But okay. but I went with Julie and a friend of the show, Walker, of Trumpkin Sauna Notes. Yeah. And I also got to sauna with Walker at his sauna. So that was a treat to be able to meet him in person and sauna with him. Great. How about you, Arrow? What's uh, what's up in your neck of the woods? Well, it, it it's been um, uh, we've we've had a very mild winter here in, in New York, but now we have snow on the ground. It is uh, above freezing, so it's gonna melt away soon. But uh, but it's sort of like welcome. I I don't you know after moving to the U.S., I don't love snow that much because it means that I have to shovel, but. Uh, but you know it's fine. I haven't I haven't done too much sauna. I did sauna like a week ago, the last, and uh, and then there's also a a a new uh, bathhouse called the Bathhouse in the heart of New York City on the Twenty Second Street. I uh, I actually just met um, Mikkel Arland, who's a who's a friend of ours. I I met him for lunch. Uh, with uh with Robbie Hammond with the Terme group and uh and uh we just uh Michael and I walked past the the, the 22nd street bathhouse but I'm gonna go there uh soon but you know life is good here and it's beautiful and sun is shining I'm very glad to introduce our guest today uh Dr. Mark Timmerman and uh and Mark and I have I, I thought that not not that I thought that we would have met but I, I I've been in contact with I believe like maybe 10 years so, so it was uh finally finally time to to get to see you not even like this virtual way but uh Mark so tell a little tell a little bit about yourself to start with sure uh I grew up in the midwest uh northern Minnesota. Uh, I grew up in a mining town called Hibbing, Minnesota. Uh, a lot of Finlanders, miners up there. And so uh, we pretty much all had saunas in our in our basements actually growing up. And we all have lake cabins with saunas and hunting and fishing camps with group saunas. So we we grew up with a sauna very much a part of our culture. And, and because of that, it's always been an important part of, of my life. I've, I'm now a family doctor. I uh, trained at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and uh, then at the University of Wisconsin, and that's where in Wisconsin now. I did a fellowship at the University of Minnesota in sports medicine, so I, I sort of do a dual practice of half family medicine and half sports medicine. Uh, no surgery, but primary care sports medicine. So the, my interest in sauna and medicine has been sort of a combination of my my culture growing up and my training as a as a physician. Well, I, I think the the most important question is: Are you a Badger fan or a Gopher fan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to say. <laughs> yeah, probably for the best. Probably for the best. <laughs> so Sam, are we done with the show? But, but I don't like the Bears. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> we can all get behind that. Fair enough. Well, and you're not 
you're not, you're very much like in my neck of the woods, not for Arrow and Sam so much, but we're in Rochester. Oh. So, and I, you know, I've been in Rochester for most of my life now. So, wow. you know, very well acquainted with the Mayo Clinic, used to work there. Huh. And then our favorite sauna that we went to multiple times is actually just outside of Viroqua. Um, so familiar with that area as well in Driftless, Wisconsin. Great. Yeah, we're, in fact, we're uh, 45 minutes from Viroqua. Hmm. You guys are neighbors. Yeah. So so we, we are... I think having a medical doctor here with us, I think we, we will talk about sauna and health, at least at, at some level. And uh, and it is, to say the least, kind of a hot topic because many people, many, you know, pun intended, obviously, but uh, but uh, but many people talk about sauna and health. And, uh, and I myself try to keep that a little bit in the background because sauna for me is so much more how do you guys feel about that well I, and i think a lot of people get introduced to sauna with this idea that it's a cure-all or it's a it's going to be this thing that is you know magically extends their life and cures all their problems um and i think you know a lot of people go into it you know hoping that and and if they get even a fraction of that that's a you know probably a good thing but um you know it does that hype up, you know, is there going to be a placebo effect? You know, I think people are inundated nowadays with, you know, the the health benefits of this gizmo and that gadget. And, we, you know, what what is real and what isn't? You know, is that is it really truly up to the, the user or is there some science behind it? Well, and I'm sure you guys have been, you know, all of you have heard this many times when people find out that you have a sauna, you know, you built one that you use it regularly, you know, that you're someone that's into sauna. I've heard this so many times. It's, oh yeah, I've heard that's good for you. You know, that mm -hmm. like that is their connection, which, which is a little bit foreign to me, you know, like I'm not, I'm not using it um, primarily for the health benefits, but that being said, the health benefits still are interesting. Um, so it, it is something that, that I've looked into just a little bit so it'll be good to learn more about that do you get a lot of questions around sauna and if so i mean what's the what's the the number one well i think i think like you suggest there are a lot of myths about sauna and a lot of uh things that marketing companies and and uh you know sort of alternative medicine folks will sort of suggest all sorts of things that are benefits of sauna uh so we have to be careful about making sure we're credible about, you know, the actual scientific health benefits, but there are indeed demonstrable uh, and well-studied uh, health benefits of sauna. There, there aren't a lot, uh, and I can talk a little bit later about why it's difficult to do studies about sauna medicine, but, uh, but yeah, there are definite health benefits of sauna. You know, I, I've noticed, you know, sauna for me has been a great, uh, you know, inflammation reducer um you know if i've got if i'm really you know tight or if i'm really you know maybe i'm work too hard you know a great way to relax those muscles um you know deal with a little bit of my back pain and i do notice i get a better night's sleep you know on the nights that i do sauna so and those are things that i can you know hang my hat on uh two things that i've noticed for myself um but i can't promise that that's going to be for everybody Although those those are two things that actually are pretty are pretty well established in the sauna literature, uh, certainly inflammation and at many levels, uh, and part of it is, uh, in a sense, what sauna does is it provides a stress, and when you stress a system, it adapts to that stress so that it can handle stress better, and then when you're not at stress, you're even better than you would have been otherwise, just like exercise. It's not the same as exercise. You don't get fitter if you sauna. And there's sort of a feeling like, well, if I if I sit in the sauna and sweat, I'm going to I'm going to get better fitness. That's not really true. Um, but there are there are benefits from stressing your system. Exercise is a stress. Heat is a stress. And the body's reaction to that stress is to adapt so that it becomes less stressed. In other words, you inflame the system in a sauna, 
And then your body says, oh, I, I know how to handle inflammation. I'll reduce inflammation so that it'll be healthier overall. So not just in muscle inflammation. I mean, even the like the endothelium, the blood vessel liners, uh, they also have less inflammation, which is definitely, we know that that leads to better heart disease or less heart disease. The, the question that I have at this point, you know, now that we're like getting slowly into the real topic here is do we have to make it do we have to divide somehow what we are talking about when we are talking about sauna and health so like what what is the process that brings these health benefits that you started talking about a little here it's like do we because because you know there's there seems to be a little some with some folks this is seems to be a little misunderstanding what sauna actually is so so should we like talk about what what is the process that gives you the health benefit yeah and i to kind of piggyback i think arrow what arrow is getting at is you know if i go in the sauna for five minutes does that count that's a good question i highly doubt it but um you know what what does the body need to go through to get you know the perceived benefits and this is exactly the difficulty when when the group of us physicians you know, led by people like Yari Laukinen and Hans Heikland, uh, you know, when we get together to talk about how we're going to collaborate on research, the question about what is sauna is a really, it's a really good question. How do we establish protocols to standardize different, uh, we, we all have different ways of using the sauna. You know, the Lithuanian saunas are low heat, high humidity and whisking. And the Finnish saunas tend to be a little drier, drier, but with loyalty. And some people do 10 minutes, some 20, some 30, some at 90 degrees centigrade, some at 60. Degrees. You know, it's how do we standardize a protocol so that we can collaborate? And then there's also uh, not to run on, but then you think about, OK, is sauna wood heated sauna, electric heated sauna, infrared sauna? uh does does a hot tub count does a turkish bath count uh, i mean what are we talking about how do you compare because there really are no good comparisons scientifically between what infrared sauna does versus a finnish wood heated sauna we really don't know the difference as far as uh how they compare yeah and you can you can you know that's a really good point like what you do for sauna that really makes a big difference you can t physically tell the difference um when julie and i used that public sauna this past weekend um there was hardly any steam there wasn't much water and the temp was a little bit lower because you know it's a lot of new people to sauna so they don't want it too high so it was hard for us to really get as hot as we normally do and especially without that steam and then there was no alternating like cold plunge which we're used to doing so afterwards on our drive home i was telling julie i don't feel like after sauna i normally feel like just a very refreshed you know people call it like you know like um like reborn kind of you feel just just light and and fresh but i told julie i, I didn't feel it as much after using that sauna yeah and and that could have been a result of co2 temperature your body saying hey you didn't do what you did last time um because i think i mean I, i'm sure if i go down the line here the four of us here if we went through our ideal sauna session it would be four different four different things and so yeah you know comparative arrow to to mark to risto to me who's getting the most benefit who's getting the least benefit at the end of the day, does it matter? You know, what are our, our, our goals, you know, when it when it comes to sauna? You know, are you going into sauna, you know, trying to fix something? Or are you trying to find something? Um, I, I think that's ultimately the, the question that people need to ask. And um, when we're talking about the health benefits, where, you know, where do we draw the line? Is it, is it, hey, this is a plus? Or hey, this is a minus, or this is a perceived benefit, um, and even the perception, you know, can have benefit. So you know, you've got thermal therapy that's in the limelight right now, from hot to cold. Like like Mark said, 
is it an IR? Is it a is it a hot tub? Um, you're you're getting the body warm. There's no doubt about it. And and is that a good thing or not? And and it's 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 going to be interesting to find out what uh, what is positive and what is negative down the road here. It's on in the online world. You often see people diving into the science pretty quickly, you know, and most of us don't understand it that well. Yeah. So so you'll have the infrared crowd talking about how infrared you sweat out more toxins and then maybe the sauna crowd who's more on the traditional side saying like well you're not hot enough to get your heat shock proteins so yeah. so then you have this back and forth between those two groups and i'm pretty sure that neither group really understands it very well well and and i think you're seeing a lot of stuff online especially on instagram i i go through uh you know different reels from different manufacturers that are promoting medical content to different you know um influencers that are pr promoting medical content and they use a, a lot of jargon and they use a lot of you know heat shock proteins and 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 some different uh, three letter combination that is supposed to be something in me that, you know, DNA, RNA, you know, X ray <laughs> seven delta nine, uh, you know, gets elevated when you do this. And, and honestly, at, at the end of the day, is it, do I feel good or not? That's what I want to know. And is this product that I'm about to buy and probably drop, you know, two or three mortgage payments on, is it going to fix those things that ail me? You know, I think if we go back to Arrow's initial question about what is it about sauna that changes you, if we talk just about heat, regardless of, you know, what kind of heat or how long of a heat or whatever, if I simplify it, heat, the, the response of our body to becoming hot is, of course, to cool itself. And in the process, it there's a little bit of an adrenaline rush. There's the... The sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight response is accentuated because our body says something's attacking me. It's heat in this case. I need to fight it. I'm going to open up my blood vessels. I'm going to try to dissipate this heat. I'm going to send out cortisol and some sympathetic nervous system, increase my pulse, and we're going we're gonna to fight this thing. And then what happens afterwards is that once again, you know, what doesn't kill us, you know, benefits us, our body says, okay, now I'm, I can go the other way, the rest and digest the parasympathetic nervous system, the, the vagus nerve sort of calming effect that takes over as a rebound effect from your ability to crank out this, this cortisol. And so with that comes that high experience you have that the endorphins, the endogenous morphine, the the, the norepinephrine and the, the chemicals in our body that make us feel good come with that cortisone, cortisol rush. And then afterwards we get a calming effect as our parasympathetic system takes over. And we do know that the, in general, if we work on our parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve system, the, uh, we have less anxiety, we have better sleep, we have better blood pressure. We have the same thing that if, that happens with with uh, you know yoga and meditation and all the things that we do that calm our system and increase our parasympathetic tone. So in general, what we're doing is we're stressing the system, sympathetic nervous system, and benefiting from a rebound parasympathetic nervous system calming effect. That glow that. Chris uh, Risto talks about uh, that we feel afterwards. You know, there's there's a lot of lot of to to think about what you just said, but but so it's, it's like a common denominator here is that the stressing your system, so you have to push your system. Is is that the word? Yep. So if you, if you do something just a little, you don't maybe stress it enough. <laughs> Am I right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> How much do you need? We don't know. That's the question. That's what we need to figure out in in studies i can lift a 25 you know a 25 pound weight once but is that a workout well and i mean that's so true you talk about all those feel good chemicals afterwards you know sauna is a little addicting that way thankfully 
like the way that we sauna, it's quite a long process. You know, we're using a wood burning sauna. It's several hours. Like if I could just press a button and get it, I might be in trouble. You know, that's the trouble with like cigarettes and, and hard drugs that are just so easy to get and consume. Um, but I also tell like when we introduce people to it, I don't like to take it too easy on them. Like, uh, you know, I want to give them the full experience and they'll actually get more of those, you know, they'll get more hooked on it if they've gone through the full process rather than having it be just like the kindergarten level. Sure. So yeah, Risto, what I'm hearing you say is like, hey, they might go to the YMCA and have a diet Coke. They're coming over to your house for the full, full sugar. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And and as you mentioned, the cold plunge is a part of that because that even takes the stress even a step farther. You get even more cortisol released, even more of those endorphins released. Uh, and so that uh and there's also definite improvement in muscular function for people with rheumatoid arthritis there's some benefit in sauna if they add sauna to cold plunge there's significant benefit so that that hot cold contrast has definitely been shown to be beneficial um and once again it stresses the system even a notch farther it, it it's it's so funny I, when i listen to you I'm, I'm just constantly thinking about my own youth because when, you know when i was a kid you know obviously like most of the Finns too back in the day almost all had a summer place of some kind and, and normally it was by a lake or by the sea and and there was obviously always a sauna and then there was a jetty and then there was steps into the water and and, and i don't think that Maybe there were some medical doctors who thought that that was some kind of you know a health health related process to you, but we just had to rinse ourselves, you know, after the sauna or between the sauna rounds in the hot room. So we never ever thought about that. But and 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 it, as a kid, you know, when the water was super cold, it really did feel super cold. But 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 anyway, so that was part of the process that like you have to you have to get yourself hot, you're sweaty, and you have to rinse yourself. So now I'm talking about here in the U.S. I'm talking about that contrast heat therapy sounds excellent, but it was just a way to do your sauna back home. Well, and you mentioned you mentioned inflammation earlier. You know, the older you get, the nicer that sounds. You know, lowering your your the inflammation <laughs> in your system. Um, but I've also heard a connection between inflammation and depression for a lot of people. Well, you know, I think uh, we we don't know. Certainly, there's a connection between inflammation and cognitive uh, issues, and and some of the research that uh, Yari Laukinen has done to show decreased dementia in sauna is probably related to increased blood vessels in the brain. You know, it helps your cardiovascular system, but your brain is a part of that vascular system also, um, and. And, you know, I think when you touch on the idea about mood and depression, there's no question that the, that there is a, that runners high, those endorphins that make us feel better, uh, they, they help your mood. And I think mood is something that we can prove is helped in the sauna. And part of that too is, as you mentioned, you want to introduce people to sauna. It becomes a social thing. There's definite uh, health benefits, mental benefits, uh, depression benefits to being a part of a social network. And I think that the social aspect of sauna is really important, I think. Oh, 100%. I, I think, you know, I, I've, you know, I, I think a lot of people we've, we might have mentioned it on this show before, but we've, you know, we've spent some time talking about longevity. Um, I know I've, recently watched a documentary about centurions people that live to 100 years of age and one of their you know cornerstones or or pillars of of what allows you know that community to get to 100 years old is community them relying on each other and and having that social interaction and need and purpose allows them or you know it just wills them into long life um, when you have a purpose or when you have a group and you have someone, um, you're, you're always going to be a little bit more. So I think there's a lot to that. Well, and, you know, loneliness is stressful. 
your 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 mind is stressed and then uh, you know i assume that when your mind is stressed that stresses the body as well not in a good way <laughs> yeah get, get yourself a dog get yourself a sauna you'll live to 100 but don't I, I know only one dog who actually liked sauna a lot you know but uh, you know don't take your sa- dog into the sauna necessarily mm-hmm. i don't know about your dog sam though uh, do they um, like so i i have a little german shepherd and she loves to just do a quick lap around because my benches are so high she can she can you know kind of just squeeze underneath them and so she's a little chimney sweep because we do have a lot of spiders down here in in south carolina um so the 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 cobwebs do sometimes accumulate under there so she runs through there real quick and she just likes to sniff around (laughs) you know i i uh sauna actually i think saved our dog's life one time we uh we have a river uh, that runs right by our farm here and uh, we were snowshoeing late at night, cold night, one of those, you know, cold, clear moon moonlit nights. And uh, she went on the river, which was frozen, but not frozen enough, and went in. And uh, and she couldn't get out. She kept breaking ice trying to, it was a big German uh, short hair, good swimmer, but she couldn't get out of the ice. I jumped in, uh, much to my wife's chagrin, uh, to pull her out and thank heavens we had lit the sauna before we went snowshoeing we got her up to the uh, house and into the sauna for about a half an hour and and she warmed up but she was pretty hypothermic and so was i oh wow. well i believe it that's that's amazing yeah no i mean i i've seen videos especially online on some of the expect risto may have seen a few of these on the online communities too but um i've seen i've seen plenty of uh you know those lap dogs and they'll go curl up right in front of the sauna heater, you know, and they're mm-hmm. on the ground. You know, it's probably only 70 degree concrete at that point, but they love curling up next to that little sauna heater uh, when it's going. As of uh, as of recording this recording this episode, we are actually, uh, Risto, Sam and I are going to be on the Finlandia Foundation Sauna Week tomorrow. And we're going to be talking about the four generations of Finnish sauna. And uh, and not to throw in any spoilers, but uh, but the uh, but the one thing that that we have actually also discussed before is that uh, that sauna did lose quite much when it moved from outdoors to inside, and uh, and like there was this crazy back home when when every apartment built basically you know that you had to like build your own sauna in your in your bathroom which is kind of what is going to happen in this country as well or in North America as well but 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 that's obviously is kind of a problem because it was back in the day it was very like community based uh practice and now all of a sudden you have like a two seater even a one seater in your basement and there you are by yourself so you're missing part of that that well-being mm-hmm. procedure ever since coming out of covid and and everything you know uh, communal community is is very you know uh important to a lot of people and getting back into some kind of a social club or some kind of a gathering you know it, it has a lot like we talked about it has a lot of positive benefits so um you know when you're thinking about sauna make sure you think about how you can invite your friends don't just buy a four by four box that only you fit into um sauna is best shared yeah, I was going to say, I agree. We we often love introducing people to sauna. We can fit eight comfortably in our sauna. And uh, and we we, uh, we we crank it up. We tell people, come on over for dinner, uh, but uh, bring a towel. We'll sauna first. And uh, I'll admit, sometimes we'll have a cocktail before the sauna. I know it's not always a good idea, but, uh, you know, we definitely have one afterwards. Uh, and then we sit down to dinner together, and I, I guarantee that a dinner with eight people after they've taken a sauna together is just a different experience, and people go away from that evening. They just always call back or write back and say, that was one of the best evenings that we've had. Mm-hmm. I, I think it always, you know, it goes back to what we've always talked about here on the show. It was an event. It was everything that it had to be. It was sauna. It was friendship. It was food. It was a uh, you know a memory. It was it, it had all the cornerstones of making great memory. Probably because you got lots of heat shock proteins. That's probably the key 
Um, mm-hmm. So, so you mentioned expansion. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned your personal sauna. Um, our listeners are sauna geeks, so they're going to want to hear about that. Could you describe what it's like? Yeah, I right now we have I have two saunas. One is at our house in our house. We built we built our house around our sauna. We have a big uh, stone fireplace, uh, and then downstairs we we put in a sauna, wood heated sauna that uh, also feeds into our our uh, our big chimney. Um, the sauna is uh, it's six by ten. Uh, with a Harvia wood heated stove that we love, um, and we live on a 200 acre farm, and there's there's plenty of wood, so uh, I'm able to to fuel the stove. I take at least five saunas a week, uh, and and uh, it's just part of my my habit. Every afternoon, uh, I light the sauna. It's sort of part of what I do. And then my, the other sauna, uh, and I told you guys earlier, I think my favorite sauna is I at our lake cabin up in northern Minnesota, we have a, a sauna that I, I made out of my grandfather's ice fishing shanty. Uh, I grew up uh, ice fishing for northern spearing in a, uh, a little four by six shanty that he built. We would drag it onto the ice in the wintertime and drag it off in the springtime and park it on the shore. And about 20 years ago, I I decided I would make it into a sauna. So I insulated it and uh, lined it with cedar and made a little bench. I had a, uh, an old Finlander up there make a, a little tiny wood stove for me uh, that just fits this little little sauna great. And it's right on the shore because it's a it's an ice shanty. It still has the license uh, on on the door so that the DNA awesome. is in trouble. Uh, and that's that. And whenever I'm in there, I think of my grandfather because I spent all this time with him in the winter times in that building. Oh, that's wonderful. That is, I think that's the definition of, of, you know, just that sauna heritage, that sauna culture, you know, especially being able to repurpose something from your past and, and enjoy it, you know, for the long term. That's so cool because I was so pumped when a family member bought my old house from me and was able to keep my my original sauna that I built in the family and, and continue to be used. So um, that's just great. No, it, really cool. Well, in finding, you know, finding people like you who are in the health world and understand the science and the medicine, um, you know, the human body but also understand the culture of sauna. That's so, that's so rare. Um, it's just, it even finding someone that thinks that sauna, that you might need steam in a sauna, you know, by splashing water on the rocks, that's pretty rare, but, but to get it like you do, that's an important thing. You know, your, your voice is an important voice in the online sauna world. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Now, uh, I, I, when I do sauna, I, I, I sauna, sa- do sauna vigorously. So it is like, you know, back, back, in, I can say almost now back in the day, I used to start my sauna session with smoking a cigar, which took a very long time before, before I, but that was perfect for the sauna heating process because, you know, a one hour cigar takes one hour and then your, <laughs> then your heater is hot when, when you're done or sauna is hot. But now, is there like a, are there like any telltale signals that that now that I've done you know the sauna that I actually maybe gain some health benefits like if I get my if I get that runner's high endorphins flowing does that mean that that now the system is working now sauna is doing good for me it, it, can it, can you like say something as simple as that or is it more complicated ah even simpler if you're sweating your body's getting heat stress and trying to release that heat. So okay. If you're sweating, it's working. There's no more simpler way to put it. I mean, there's a reaction. You're not going to just sit there. You, you're, your body's sweating for a reason. Yeah, all that healthy sweat, though, you got to balance that with some sausage and beer. So <laughs> what, yeah. uh, Mark, if, if you could uh, suggest, I mean if the stars aligned and everybody was built the same way and you know we were all 175 pounds and our body fat was x y and z 
Um, if you could kind of lay out what would be your maybe uh, ideal or what would you suggest a, a sauna routine look like for someone trying to get into sauna to maybe get some health benefits? Once again, it's a good question and part of what we're trying to do in establishing a protocol. But I can say that um, in general, the studies of sauna that have been done are generally, uh, they generally work on a basis of about two to three saunas a week to provide a health benefit and about 20 minutes per session of sauna. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stopping you here right now. I'm sorry. What do you mean by that session? What, what does that session mean? Yeah, I think exposing yourself to 20 minutes of heat. And once again, we don't know how hot it has to be. Probably 175 degrees or more, uh, depending on the humidity. There's lots of variables. But I think in general, if, if, uh, if you can sauna, if you can, if you can, Place yourself in a in a situation where you're overheated for 20 minutes twice a week. I think you would develop health benefits, and we're we're going to try to prove that. But most of the studies that have shown better blood pressure, better uh, congestive heart failure, better asthma, most of those studies are based roughly on two to three episodes a week of about 20 minutes of heat exposure. Like on, if I have guests, we'll do two or three 20 minute, 15 minute sessions with mm -hmm. cold plunge in between and make it more of an event, as you say. But, but what I do personally is, and I do it more than two or three times a week, but I'd spend about 20 minutes. I just do one 20 minute session roughly after I'm exercising. Um, there is some benefit to that as well. Although I do it more just because it feels good and it's a part of my habit more than trying to get some health benefits the 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 reason why i'm asking is is kind of you know if 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 we if i think about the newbies to sauna i'm I'm thinking about that 20 minutes i i like if we are are like between that that, that like like the, the, that like heat minimum that we are talking about maybe like 70 degrees centigrade 70 maybe 75 somewhere there it must be it, it it's 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 got to be very hard for a person to stay in in the hot room for 20 minutes so it, it's like you have to lower the, the heat you know you cannot do that yourself right it took me a while to build up to being able to sit in in high temps for long periods of time i mean it i'm you know i i've been taking sauna pretty religiously now for the last few years and I, you know, I can comfortably sit in the 200 degree room for about 15 minutes. That low? You're you're that low, Sam? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm still working. So, you know, there's always room for growth. <laughs> Sam, you're you're gonna be fired, man. You know, it's just like this was a mistake. You know, yeah, that... right. But but so obviously, my point being, my point being that 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 20 minutes can be divided to uh, like like three, uh, uh, fifth, you know. 12 minute sessions or something or you know, do seven minute session or something right so that that's what we are talking about yeah or a lower temperature or sit on the lower bench you know the our, our newbies will often sit on the lower bench or or uh, they'll still the newbies will sweat sooner uh than mm. the people who are experienced so they'll be able to sweat at a lower temperature than i will because my body's adapted to that to that mm. heat so it doesn't take as hot a sauna for a for a newcomer to get the same benefit. Once again, if they start sweating and it's 160 degrees Fahrenheit, then that's hot enough. So your sauna practice is you have both a longer, multiple rounds, guests are come coming over, it's a dinner party, and then also a daily where it's heated up and after exercise and you're going in there for a good sweat. You're, you're, are you how often do you create steam when you're sounding? I always do. I what I do there and there's no this isn't scientific necessarily, but I do I I I sit in the sauna for about 10 minutes until I start to sweat without steam and then I apply the loyally uh to give myself steam and I usually use some aromatherapy. I like uh, essential oils in my 
you know, that's a personal thing too. But I wait until I sweat and then I add the loyally and then I get it really hot and then I go in outside or into the indoor pool. Yeah, I, I think it, it is definitely a personal preference when it comes to sense. You know, we've talked about that, you know, and I, I think I'm probably about the same. You know, I don't I usually don't, uh, you know, run right for the ladle right when I jump in. You know, I usually like to get uh, warmed up a little bit before I start throwing the steam around. But then once I do, it's, uh, you know, it's usually pretty consistent after that point. I like a, I like a good amount of steam. One thing that I learned from Lithuanians when we, uh, we worked with them. Uh, that I love this tradition, and we do it when we have a group in the sauna, is when we, before we take the ladle and apply the first uh, round of steam, we, we pass the, I fill the ladle with water and pass it in front of everyone. Everyone puts two fingers in the water, in the ladle, in the cup, and they make a wish. And then after everyone's made a silent wish, then I pour the, the water on the rocks and then i say let it be true and everyone loves that uh that tradition well if you get a really huge ladle everyone's going to make the same wish they're going to be wor- in its full everyone's going to be worried about that steam <laughs> yeah th- yeah somebody's in there i i i wish there was less steam <laughs> <laughs> So we we let let's just uh, so that we won't get carried away. Um, obviously, when we talk about sauna and we talk about newbies, we have to also talk about they're not only only newbies, but all people. I've been talking about the, the the bad stuff about sauna. You know, there are health benefits, but there are also risks. And uh, and and so, how should one be prepared? You know, or what are the risks when it comes to sauna? That's a good question. Uh, in general, sauna is pretty safe. Um, there, there's concern about uh, cardiovascular risks um, and, and more related to sudden cardiovascular risks. We know that in general, sauna is good for your cardiovascular system, but you can get rhythm issues if you have heart problems to start with. You can stimulate, because of the uh, adrenaline rush, you can change your heart rhythm. And so having a, a, a cataclysmic heart rhythm issue is the risk. It's rare, and it doesn't happen to people who don't have heart disease. But if you have a rhythm problem with your heart, definitely sauna can uh, create an event for you. And this is especially true if you put your face in cold water after a sauna. And this is this is why uh, if you don't know about your heart or if you have heart problems, you it's probably advisable not to do a cold plunge with your head underwater after a sauna. And that's because of something called the diving reflex where if cold water hits a heated face, it can change your heart rhythm and make it difficult to breathe. That's one thing I would say we we should be careful of. I will also say that alcohol, most of the problems that people have with out al- or with the sauna are related to alcohol, uh, and that's just because alcohol accentuates the the very effect of sauna. It uh, further dilates your peripheral blood vessels and it takes uh, blood away from your brain even more than the sauna does, and so it's sort of like uh, doubling down on on uh, the the uh, on the stress of the sauna if you're using alcohol so uh becoming dehydrated lightheaded passing out that usually doesn't happen unless you're abusing alcohol and the sauna sure and and maybe for some of our other uh listeners out there that may or may not uh indulge in other um you know legal or, or illegal substances um, is there any benefit or benefit or health advisories a- around anyone that maybe uh, um, maybe ingest uh, you know, marijuana? I don't know. I don't okay. know if anyone's looked at that. It's a good question. Marijuana doesn't have the same uh, dilation effect that alcohol does regarding your periphery, but I don't know about that. There'll, there'll be more to come. I'm sure there will be. Yeah. 
talking about that so what are you you said that that you're trying to to get this uh like get get a uh, i can't remember the the word you used but this general understanding of of the circumstances when it comes to you know studying sauna but but so what what besides that what are the future what, how do you see the future path of of sauna medical research on sauna yep good question so what what the physicians that are involved with the international sauna association are trying to do is figure out once again how to come up with some sort of a protocol that will allow us to all study the same thing because it takes the thing about clinical studies meaning uh taking actual human subjects and trying to do some research that is prospective meaning instead of taking a group of people that already sauna and a group of people that don't sauna and comparing them that's usually what we do now uh, are these people healthier than these people and that's what we're trying to compare the better studies are true clinical studies where they're randomized control studies where you take a group of people and you say we're going to start here and and measure you now and we're going to have so many of you do so many saunas so many times a week at so much temperature at such and such a, a humidity for three years and compare it to the people who don't. Uh, and then we'll find out, then we can really make a comparison clinically on whether sauna provides a benefit. But the hurdle there is huge because it takes a lot of subjects. It takes a lot of money. Um, we have to standardize this over a country so that we can collaborate so that, uh, you know, in order to get, uh, if, if someone at the Mayo Clinic wanted to do this, it would be really hard to, to develop a sauna lab so you can standardize your therapy and get 500 people to come in and do saunas three times a week. It's, it's an immense project. So to spread it over many countries with some sort of a similar protocol over a longer period of time uh would be beneficial one of the other hurdles is that if you if you take uh, a cholesterol pill and you want to do research on whether it will lower your cholesterol well the drug companies stand to benefit a lot from that and they're happy to fund that research and in the sauna world you know maybe some of the spa industry maybe some of the sauna stove manufacturers they might benefit from research but it's hard to get funding for this kind of thing well, that's where it could be good to either have some larger health institutions that are committed to more holistic lifestyle uh, interventions in maybe in conjunction with some countries that, you know, like if, if you know, Sauna gets good press, Finland gets good press. Um, good point. We, we are like early in that regard because uh you know like sauna obviously is getting like more popular by the day and 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 even even the that kind of sauna that us three most likely would prefer the most and uh and 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 kind of I'm coming back to to what I said before that um that uh it, it, for me it it feels that not everyone is using the whatever they have in the way that they would get health benefits but mark you, you sort of like proved me wrong there already though you said that you know it's just when you sweat it is going to be good for you and uh but 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 the one thing that uh that you know the, the people who only sweat what they are missing maybe i don't know about that because i don't know any better but but it's the you know the heavenly feeling that i personally get you know when i get to that dinner table after the sauna yeah, that that's where you feel like a million bucks. Well, and here's the question I ask people. So I'll ask you this, Mark, you know, if if they came out with a study, let's say the protocol is developed and they they find that sauna is healthy, but there are maybe just like some things where it's maybe not quite so healthy and they find that like for this little aspect, it's it's a little unhealthy. Maybe people's outcomes were a little worse, which just for so our listeners know, that's not the case. They've already done large population studies and it, it doesn't, the, the data is not pointing that way. But let's just say that that's what happened. And we found that sauna is actually a little unhealthy, maybe like bacon or cheeseburgers. Would you still sauna? 
Well, I know that uh, alcohol is not good for you in, in really any manner or fashion. Uh, and I still will have a drink each night uh, after my sauna. Uh, you know, it's a matter of a moderation, I think. Uh, <laughs> But thankfully, that's not the. Thankfully, you're not having to make that choice right now. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I well, and, and that's just it. If I had to, uh, you know, I, I I used to be a smoker, you know. Thankfully, I gave that up. Um, but you know, every time you you know you flip the top of that box, you're grabbing a you know seven minutes off your life, and um, you know you got to make that choice. And and I think for so many people with with vices or you know things that they're doing that might not be the best for them. I think in the in the back of their head they know that and, and they are they're they're making that choice every time they choose to do whatever that is and is it giving them more benefit than the negative and I think at the time in in place most most people would say I'm getting more benefit than I am a negative out of this. Yeah, those those centenarians that you mentioned earlier Sam, they don't all, you know, they're not all just like eating celery and walking 20 miles a day, you know, or doing no. CrossFit. You no, know, no, no. Live... Yeah, they're not taking a million supplements. They're not doing it. You know, they're they're living a, you know, the the majority of them were living a a, a pretty simple life. Um, not very extravagant, you know, but they were eating, you know, culturally normal food for that region. And, you know, they were they were just overall, they were content. You know, they weren't they weren't searching for that next thing. So if sauna can be a uh you know, a, a vehicle in which you find that center, you find that contentness, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's enough. And really sauna compares pretty, pretty similarly to exercise. And we don't, I mean, other than maybe over-exercise can cause some musculoskeletal problems. Uh, we, we really don't find much, uh, we, we don't find many bad things about exercise, uh, exercise, produces a stress to your system for which you adapt your system and it becomes stronger. And I think it, heat stress and, and sauna stress is very similar in that it's not likely to cause a problem. It's likely to provide benefit like exercise does. There's a burning question, you know, and I think something that we should talk about for a couple of minutes here, you know, I, I hear it time and time again, especially from people that, you know, may or may not be sauna enthusiasts, but, you know, this, this idea, you know, we, we talked about it, but it, are toxins being actually removed from the body? You know, am I sweating out things that I shouldn't be in my body? Am I, am I, re, you know, doing something overall that's beneficial? You know, what, what are, what are the mechanisms of the body here, Mark, you know, from a professional um, you know, what am I doing? You know, what's my body doing? You really want to go down that rabbit hole? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I I am so sick of, of people saying that if I put this magic tape on my feet, I'll get rid of all the mercury in my body. Yeah. Well, well here's the thing. So, if we have chemicals in our body, sweat can help get rid of some of those chemicals. The question is what what chemicals are we talking about? What toxins are we talking about? I anything can be a toxin. Uh, hemoglobin can be a toxin. If, if, if we have too much of it, if you're blood doping and you have too much hemoglobin, it's a bad thing. Uh, so the question is, what is a toxin? There have been a couple of studies, only two, uh, about, uh, about sauna and toxins. Uh, there, there was a study that a, a a number of policemen that were exposed to methamphetamine because they were undercover cops, uh, they had uh, symptoms, long that long lasting symptoms from their exposure. They didn't have a measurable amount of toxin, but they were exposed to a toxin over a period of time, like in some other occupations like lead miners or uranium miners. And they developed reactions to that toxin over time. And sauna did provide the perception of improvement in their symptoms it didn't really show that the sound had reduced their toxins, but it made them feel better. And there was another, there's one other study done, a German study where they had uh, the measurable, uh, they had patients with measurable PCBs, uh, you know, plastic breakdown products in their systems. And once again, 
PCBs are fat soluble, so they they exist in our fat. You can't get rid of them. We don't we don't sweat or or pee PCBs out of our system. But they did find that the patients that had elevated PCBs when they had sauna therapy, they felt better and had less symptoms. So in those cases, we're not getting rid of toxins, but because of the other health benefits that we've talked about for sauna, we are making patients, we are improving patients. Other people will talk in the alternative medicine world, and I'm kind of classically Mayo Clinic trained, so I, I'm in the Western medicine world, but you will talk about minute levels of trace elements of zinc or, or other things that could be considered toxins, but they're not measurable in a clinical sense as a toxin. So, to, and, and do we excrete some of those from our system? I suppose, but most of us don't have truly clinically toxic levels of, uh, of zinc or, or cadmium or other sort of trace elements. Now, lead is an interesting thing because we do know that lead is a toxin that we can measure and that causes symptoms, uh, clinical symptoms. And perhaps uh, we could use sauna to reduce lead levels, uh, a true toxin, but we don't know that. There's, there, we don't have any science that helps us know if sauna will benefit that. So we feel, a lot of us feel like life is toxic. And we have a lot of things that we feel we're inundated with that make us feel bad. Uh, and, and will sauna release those toxins by sweating them out of our system? That's just too simplistic a, a viewpoint, and it's not really scientific. Well, and it might, yeah, and it might like m possibly mobilize your system a little bit more, get all the machinery working faster. Because um, I noticed when I sauna, um, like I'm a little congested today, like this will all come out when I sauna, you know. I, I've got a box of Kleenex that's in the sauna because it just gets everything going in the system. Yep. But are they are these toxins that are making you feel bad? You know, we right. no, they're not toxins. You know what I mean? Sure. So that the word is toxic. <laughs> Love it. The um the problem that we are having is that uh, not not of course not me, never ever me, but we talk too much. Uh, Sam, Risto, and me, uh, honestly, to be honest here, we talk too much. So we've already spoken an hour. We have, haven't even touched the surface yet. So Mark, what's the question that you wanted to answer, but ne we never asked you? What is, is there is there a question that, that or something that you want to say, you know, for, for our audience? Uh, we've covered a lot of stuff. Um... We haven't talked about COVID. Um, you know, an interesting thing about COVID, a terrible time for sauna is because it took away the social aspect of sauna for many of us. But interestingly, there were some studies that showed that COVID has a difficult time uh, uh, persisting at, at over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so in my estimation, being in a sauna, even though it's an enclosed space, uh, is probably a safe place to be if you if you're trying to not get uh, COVID, but we don't know what quite what else to do about about COVID and sound. Hopefully, it'll keep dissipating as as time goes on. Yeah, my my brother got long COVID, and uh, he's actually he's a doctor and he um he owns a sauna, and uh, I don't know. I kept asking him if the sauna helped with his long COVID or not. And it's hard to figure that out with so many variables in his life, but you know, it didn't go away overnight um, because of sauna. So. The one thing that we haven't touched and, uh, and it's actually not even the agenda for today, but it's, it's, it's the question about how hot has the sauna be in order to kill bacteria inside the sauna. And, uh, and there's, there's a lot of like, if you go to social media, there's pe people are like fighting and laughing and uh, and pointing each other about you know the uh, the the law the law of Lolo as they say and and one of one of the ingredients of the law law of Lolo is that your feet should be above the the level of rocks and uh, and one reason for that level of rocks and feet above above it is that the lower bench if it's below the level of rocks it maybe it's not going to be hot enough so so you have to like be 
way more lazier than i mean I'm, I'm too lazy for it but you should wash your sauna after basically every use if it's not hot enough so that it won't kill, kill the bacteria by itself that's an interesting point one thing i learned uh from a, um, a belgian spa inspector uh was to use olive oil soap uh to scrub my sauna benches uh and so every month or two i'll put a a bar of the 80% olive oil uh, soap in my uh, sauna bucket. And then I'll just use a, like a scrubby pad like you have in your kitchen. And I'll, I'll dip that in the bucket and then I scrub the benches and that, that uh, it cleans it. it. It's good soap. It has a nice uh, feel and smell to it. Uh, and so that's, and then I, I rinse it down of course afterwards. And that, that seems to be a really good way to clean your sound of benches. And where do you get that soap? What soap is that? Oh, it's called Marseille soap. It's kind of okay. a, a yep. you can get it online if you just look for Marseille. Usually it's a 70 or 80% olive oil soap. Beautiful yeah. stuff. So gentlemen, final questions for, for Mark. I don't know if I have any final questions right now. I'm sure more will come up after the episode. Um, it's great to connect with you. Like I said, finding people in the health world who actually get sauna that like that never happens. So, so I really appreciate you taking the time to, to yeah, share I... your medical knowledge with us and about your sauna practice. Thanks. My pleasure. Yeah. I, I got to echo there from Risto. It, it's, you know, I think a lot of our listeners would agree they're inundated with um, promises and, and uh, it, hey, this is going to do this, this is going to do that. And I've heard this and I've heard that. We really want to be a good source to dispel the myths and the rumors and, and really just talk about sauna at its core. Yes, there are some great things about it. Yes, you know, there's going to be some things that we disagree on. But, uh, you know, if we're all in this together, um, there's a lot of positives. So I, I really appreciate your time here, Mark. I really do. Great. My My final question is... And uh, and I'm I'm sort of like always like a, like a broken record or a one trick pony. I don't know. I don't know the expressions. English is my second language. But but my question to you, Mark, is: Does sauna cure something? Well, we know that sauna improves immune function. There's plenty of data to support that. So if we allow our, I mean, our immune system allows us to fight a lot of things, and and it allows us to resist cancer. Uh, so yeah, I think by stimulating our immune system, we let our body fight things and cure things. Thank you so much. Thank Robert. you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to ask you to come back when we, uh, when we digest what you said and we can like, what did you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>